What's up, everybody? Thanks for clicking into Sports Not Carolyn Mano with you, joined once again by Chris Manick, senior writer for Sports Illustrated, the NBA analyst who is always kind enough to join us on the program. Happy almost All Star break to you. Almost All Star break. We're almost there. Thank God. <laughs> Let's hit on some big picture topics uh, as we head to the All Star break. Let's start with something that was widely discussed over the last couple of weeks, I think spurred by Kyrie Irving, really suggesting that Kobe Bryant should be the new moniker, the new image on the NBA logo, replacing Lakers legend Jerry West. Uh, Jerry West has been on media outlets in the past saying that he'd be happy to pass that torch. Is this the right call to, uh, to replace him with Kobe Bryant? I think it's worth pointing out, first of all, that the NBA has never actually acknowledged that Jerry West is the logo. He clearly is the logo. Jerry West knows he's the logo, but for whatever reason, the NBA has not acknowledged that that silhouette is Jerry West. All that being said, while I think I entertain the possibility of somebody else's silhouette uh, being the logo, I don't think Kobe Bryant is the right person for it. I think first and foremost, you have to acknowledge what happened with Kobe in the early 2000s with the sexual assault allegation. Now, he was not convicted. Um, Those charges were eventually dismissed. But I don't know that's something the NBA would want to revisit when you make a player like Kobe uh, put in a high-profile position of being the logo. I understand why Kyrie Irving and other younger players are pushing for this. They grew up idolizing Kobe Bryant. He was their Michael Jordan, people of an older generation. So there's obvious support for him there, but I don't see how the NBA could could do something like that. If what I've been told, they're really not considering it. This is the first I've heard of somebody revisiting this part of Kobe Bryant's past, because I think in the immediate aftermath of his passing uh, and the tragedy that involved his daughter as well, it was something that people needed to have a little bit of distance from. Um, But now you're saying that this is an indisputable part of his legacy and as such um, should be included in the conversation. You know, that's something that struck me in the aftermath of, of his passing, even though it was a tragedy, is that it is a complicated legacy. And that was met with, you know, all kinds of frustration from fans who said, how dare you bring this up? How dare you bring this up? And the timing might have been wrong at that time. But, you know, now that we've come full circle a little bit and it's been a calendar year, is this now something that needs to be considered when discussing the complexity of his legacy? Uh, Look, if you're going to do a deep dive on the complexity and the legacy of Kobe Bryant, it absolutely is part of his narrative. It's part of his history. I I don't think, generally speaking, it needs to be brought up consistently. It just does need to come up if we're having a serious conversation about Kobe Bryant replacing Jerry West on the logo because there will undoubtedly be a large faction of people uh, justifiably upset by that because of what allegedly happened in the early 2000s. Let's move on. Uh, Let's stay with the Lakers legend. Let's talk about LeBron James a little bit as we head to the All-Star break. You look at the month of February, his minutes are ticking up. Um, Is this a good idea or a bad idea for the Lakers? Oh, LeBron would tell you it's a good idea because he believes he's indefatigable. He believes that he can play 40 some odd minutes every single night and be fine when the playoffs come around and look, he's a unicorn. He is a unique athlete that the likes of which we'll probably never see again. Someone who takes care of his body exceptionally well. and has some incredible physical gifts. All that being said, the Lakers end game is not being the first or second seed in the Western conference. Their end game is winning a championship. And I think you're, you benefit uh, more towards that end game uh, by protecting the minutes of LeBron James. You go back to the early month of the season It was like 31 minutes per game in the month of December. It was like 33 minutes per game in January and February. Now you're up to about 36 minutes per game. And if Anthony Davis stays out for the foreseeable future, you could see those minutes continue to rise for LeBron James. I don't know how that benefits the Lakers in the long term. Look, the Lakers could win on anybody's home floor. But this year, home court advantage is going to be minimal at best for whatever team has it. I just don't see the need to burn yourself out to get a home court advantage or to, to, to establish yourself at a higher seed in the standings at the expense of playing LeBron too many minutes. 
Let's touch on another team in Utah that has seemingly been on a tear so far this season heading into the All-Star break. What is your analysis of how good this team is, where they're heading? I mean, can they continue to do what they've been doing? Oh, they're the real deal. Uh, The Jazz, I think a lot of people looked past after last season because they got beat in the first round. Well, they got beat in the first round, but they were a Mike Conley three-point shot away from advancing in that first round, beating Utah. That shot rimmed out, the, Den- the Nuggets advanced. They became the darling story of the NBA bubble. Uh, but the Jazz came back this year with a full roster. Bojan Bogdanovic came back into the mix. He was out during the Jazz uh, play in the bubble. Mike Conley, year two with Utah, has been a lot better, playing like an all-star. And the rift between Rudy Gobert and Donovan Mitchell appears to be completely healed And both those guys are playing elite all-star basketball. Gobert, I think you can make an argument that he is in the MVP conversation for what he's done on both ends of the floor. Meanwhile, off the bench, you have Jordan Clarkson, who has become the front runner for NBA sixth man. They have an excellent coach in Quinn Snyder. You're not going to believe in a team as a playoff title contender until they do it. But the Jazz right now, they have all the pieces to beat anyone in the Western Conference. I think in the East, one of the buzzy teams has to be the New York Knicks. I mean, obviously the Nets, but with the consistency that the Knicks have shown at certain points this season and with Tom Thibodeau, the head coach, saying that he doesn't feel like they have any depth issues, that he's getting contributions from a number of different players. I mean, you mentioned the Jazz being the real deal. Are the Knicks the real deal? Well, the Knicks are good which in and of itself is nothing short of remarkable. I mean, most people had the Knicks predicted to finish in bottom three in the Eastern Conference standings. As we speak, they are sitting right in the middle of the, of the Eastern Conference playoff pack. And that, if they're able to sustain that, that's, I mean, Tom Thibodeau wins coach of the year for that alone. Um, how sustainable it is, we'll see. I mean, some of those guys on that team, they play a lot of minutes. Tibbs is known to burn guys out, and we'll see how much – Julius Randle, R.J. Barrett, young guys, but still guys playing a lot of minutes have down the stretch. Uh, You see Derrick Rose in that mix right now. How well he plays down the stretch will be critical. But one number to look at with the Knicks is that as uh, right now they are a top two team in the NBA defensively. If they can maintain a place inside the top five, they will be a playoff team, and that would be a huge accomplishment. Look, the Knicks haven't been above 500 through 35 or 35 games in the last 20 years. Like, that's amazing what the, this team has accomplished with so little expectations. If you're a Knicks fan, you're probably feeling pretty good. And we've talked in the past about how maybe the front office wasn't the right place for Thibodeau, but a head coaching position certainly is. I mean, how much credit does he get for their defensive prowess? Is he directly responsible for implementing these kinds of changes that have taken the Knicks from a, a much improved team to now a playoff team? Oh, he's almost entirely responsible. I mean, the Knicks didn't make many substantive changes from last year. They kept their powder dry in the offseason and didn't go out and sign guys to big contracts that didn't make a lot of sense. They elected to play these young guys, and Thibodeau is the new variable that's been introduced. Look, Tom is an unbelievable coach. Like, his, his coaching acumen has never really been in question. It is, just to your point, he is – probably the least qualified human being on the planet, this side of Larry Brown to be the coach and general manager. He just like, he, he argues with himself. Like he he (laughs) doesn't, doesn't, doesn't make a lot of sense in that dual role. Just as a head coach, you saw it in Chicago. You saw it for a period of time in Minnesota before the wheels fell off the wagon with the Timberwolves. And you are seeing it now in New York. This guy is an excellent coach. He is a brilliant defensive mind. And he has taken what I think is still a very flawed roster and push them into the playoff mix. Just before we let you go, one last question, because we're heading into the All-Star break. I mean, give this NBA season so far a grade, if you can, in terms of overall execution. I don't know if this is accurate or not. I get the sense that a lot of players are ready for this All-Star break, maybe more so than in in seasons past. It's been a very strange year for everybody, a strange season so far. How good of a job has the league done uh, up to this point in overall execution and making sure that however we do it, we get through this unusual season? Well, I mean, they're doing everything they can short of going back into a bubble, but I've been on the record that they should have gone back into a bubble. Look, this, you know, first half of the season, 
they've missed more than 35 games, you know, canceled or postponed because of COVID issues. These are issues that would not have come up if they had brought the league back into the bubble for the first couple of months of the season. Nobody is saying you do a six-month bubble. That wouldn't work. The Players Union would never go for it. But for a league that began after Thanksgiving when they came to training camp, a season that started around Christmas, when you knew there would be a surge in coronavirus cases, I, I think it was a mistake not to go uh, into that bubble. And so outside of the bubble, the leagues did everything they can. They've you know created some pretty good health and safety protocols. They've you know limited travel as best they can. They've you know tightened restrictions when they need to be tightened. But if you went in the bubble, you wouldn't have this problem. You would have a pro- other problems for sure, especially players being uh, unhappy with that situation. But uh, sometimes you got to do what you got to do to protect the integrity of the game. Now are we past the point where a bubble makes sense? Probably because the numbers have gone down as the league has released, you know, biweekly uh, COVID infections. And they expect to continue to go down in the months that follow, uh, you know, as we get this vaccine circulated throughout the country. Uh, and one, you know, sign that you know that the league is trending more in the opposite direction is that you know, more than, I think, 15 teams are going to start having fans in after the All-Star break. 1,000, 2,000 here or there. That number is only going to go up. And for a league that is desperate, for fan-generated revenue, uh, that's something that they're going to take advantage of if they can. All right. Chris Mannix, senior writer at Sports Illustrated, thanks as always for being with us here on Sports Not. You got it.